Okay, thank you for coming all to this panel about uh, journalism, rethinking journalism, rethinking the concept of debates. Um, my name is Ulrich. Uh, I come from something called Constructive Institute. I'll talk a little about that. I can talk for hours about it, but uh, I'll try not to. Um, we have a bridge when, which we use when we start a presentation always because uh, to remind ourselves that we come from a profession that it's not because we want, but sometimes we dig the ditches deeper in the public conversation, uh, not intentionally, but due to our culture. Uh, and what if, what if journalism can actually also create more understanding in society? So that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, and that's me. I, I'm a form of a background of, of I'm a journalist by training. I've been uh, running some newsrooms and I started Constructive Institute in 2017 out of frustration with myself um, to see if we can do something different. Um, this, the topic of today is healing the toxic circle of media and politics. Um, can we do it differently? And we think we can't. And as in any change, for instance, if you want to lose weight as a middle-aged fat man, you need to dare standing in front of the mirror, mirror in the bathroom behind closed door and take the consequence of what you see. Otherwise, you will start uh, continue eating and drinking too much and you will never lose weight. So you have to be self-critical and we come from a profession where we are very critical to everybody else but ourselves. So this is what we want to try to do, talk about that. I'm, a, I'm really not the interesting part. These people, because I'm just the talker, these people are doers. They're editors from Scandinavian public service stations, and they are actually here to show you uh, examples on that is actually possible to do something differently and actually also doing it in a way that is appealing and interesting and actually build bridges in society. And we'll get back to that. But frame setting, why are we talking about this? Why have you chosen to come here? It's most likely because you also feel there's something going on in democracy. In 2021 and this year, more than ever, we'll talk to our children and grandchildren many years from now. These were the years when we understood that the whole concept of democracy, we can't take it for granted. We thought we could. Um, polarization will be the next pandemic. There are so many things in business uh, models, uh, financial models, algorithms, and in our culture that spreads the virus of division. And, and journalism is one of them. Not because we want to, because we just going into the habit of doing that. And there are so many things that separates us, um, and uh, that will be the big story that we have to cover, and we should try uh, to cover it in such a way that we don't make it worse. Maybe we can even make it better. And we know by now that if even the strongest democracy in the world can fail, um, um, if the press do not do its job, as we saw it in, in the United States, we know now that even if we spent 20 years and 1,000 billion US dollars, we can't endorse democracy in different countries. This is Afghanistan. This is not a picture from uh, Hungary, could be, but it's from the streets of Copenhagen, where people who have a different view of the world because their information comes from different sources, uh, they don't trust any government, any authority, any journalist, and they have their own view about the world. And uh, when I was a little boy growing up in Copenhagen, nobody uh, burned dolls of prime ministers in the streets of Copenhagen. So even in our little uh, peaceful countries uh, far north, um, there are more cynicism. Things are happening even there in the public debate. And of course, we're in the midst of a war, uh, Ukraine, where you can see that the, the most important weapon there are not tanks, it's words, it's storytelling. Who tells the story about the truth. Um, in Germany, um, they have introduced a word which was latest used in the 30s, uh, Lügenpresse. You don't trust traditional news organizations covering even important uh, stories like immigration, um, crime, uh, stuff like that. So we are at a place where we, we need to rethink what we are doing and ask tough questions. Is journalism part of the problem? And how do we become part of the solution too? And uh, one of the questions it would be, why are we in our profession always thinking about warfare and boxing when we invite people in to talk to each other about the future? Um, 
we always call it debates. Debate comes from French, debattre. It means uh, fighting. Why do we think it has to be a fight? Why do we call it, and this is Danish, election fight? Uh, why do we call it crossfire? Why do we call it uh, duels, uh, hard talk? Why do we call it red corner, blue corner, winners and losers? Why do we do that? Why, why is the framework of that? Because it, because it has been like that for many years. And we'll talk about that tonight. But if we orchestra politics and political discussions in our democracy as boxing, it will be boxing. This is an example of a Danish public service company a few years ago. They organized actually political debates in a boxing ring, in a big sports arena, and broadcasted it live. And there were disco music, smoke, half-naked women, and people had to wear either a blue t-shirt or a red t-shirt. And this is the, the prime minister entering, and the famous news anchor, he was playing the referee, and he was hitting a bell if anybody dared to answer more than 30 seconds to a question. No wonder politics is boxing if we do it this way. We did a big survey at Constructive Institute on, on the people's or Danes' expectations to politicians. What do they think about it? And this is in Danish, but I'll just tell you the, the worst thing people think about debates is when politicians do not answer the questions they've been asked. But the next ones are all about if they attack someone, if they interrupt, if they are mean, if they're personal, whereas they really look for politicians who dare to be in doubt, who uh, have ideas of solving people's problems. They don't see that. And why? Maybe because we don't allow that. So we talk about incentive structures. Politicians, this is the most uh, senior in, in, in our little country. He said the press put a, has put a blanket of stupidity over humanity. That's a, that's a mean sentence, right? But that's how we, people talk about us now. But maybe there's a tendency that we focus our attention and therefore also the politicians' attention and the public attention on things that are so extreme. And we do it in such a way that the extreme in the minds of people is that the world is extreme. Um, and we favor the most rude and the loud in the debate. And we give them airtime because we think it's entertaining. We think that's what, what we should do. It, cl it generates clicks, attention, and views and shares but it has consequences. Terrorists, populists, they love it. They talk directly into the, our news criteria. Of course, if, you don't, if you're not allowed to publicize what you want to say, if there's censorship, if you're being shot at as a journalist, if you're being put in prison, that's the worst. So freedom of speech is, of course, essential for everything. But in most of our country, we try to deal with other organizations are much better at looking at freedom of speech, getting journalists out of jail and all that. And thank God they're there. But what about the purpose? Why do you go to work every day? What's the responsibility you feel for your profession, what you do? What's the ethics you use? What's the structures, the incentive structures in your newsroom? What do you look at? What don't you look at? What do you, which questions do you ask? All that is based on culture. And it's based on not only the, the, the formal news criteria you use, but also the informal. All that leads to the content, and the content provides and is the most important filter between reality and the public perception of it. So we try to change the global news culture and help democracy uh, by helping journalism be more sustainable and meaningful to people. We're funded, just so you know, by philanthropists and organizations who think this is important, so we are not a consultancy company. Uh, we work in three ways, generate new knowledge about what we're doing uh, in, in, and what's the consequence of journalism. We try to inspire with conferences and workshops around the world, just signed a deal with the Times of London. And uh, we have a fellowship program where we try to uh, find best talents and give them time to, um, to reflect and come up with new ideas and go back and become ambassadors for all this. So finally, when I should say uh, what constructive journalism is. Well, there are two sets of glasses we put on when we filter the world for people. One is breaking news. When I was young, it was just called news, but it's the same thing. Tell people what's going on as fast as technology allows you to. So speed is important. We ask questions like what, when did it happen, where. Um, the more dramatic, the better. We are police car. We uh, deal with drama and conflict, we angle on that. The more dramatic and the more full of conflict we think, the better it is. And that is also good for society, 
don't exaggerate it, which we sometimes do, but it's important. And then there's the other thing, investigative reporting, which is where we get our identity from. The fourth estate, controlling power, putting people with power to account, which is extremely important. But thinking about it, investigative journalism is always about yesterday. It's about who's to blame for the problems we're in in society. We ask questions like, who did it? Why did it happen? And we are critical, and we play the role of a prosecutor or a judge if we don't take care, and we angle on the crook and the victim. If you buy into that, what do we, and you, you agree that we're the most important filter between reality and the public perception of it, what do we talk about in the public debate? We talk about what's happening now and what happened yesterday. And we talk about what is dramatic and full of conflict, and we talk about the crooks and the victim. And here comes the question. What is politics about? Politics is actually about the future, right? But it doesn't fit into our news criteria, really. We really don't care about your idea or your vision or your dream or your ideology. But why do you say this now? Was then you said something different four years ago. Is that a lie? That's how I'm trained to do. So constructive journalism is not an alternative to those two. It's thinking good journalism can also be about tomorrow. It can be about inspiration, asking questions that I was not taught in journalism school and neither were you. Now what and how? Questions that point to the future. We are curious and we try to also to facilitate debates about important issues and problems in society and what are the potential solutions to them, and what's the best practice. This kind of thinking, um, we're partners from United Nations to small startups, and it's called now, this kind of thinking, mega, a mega trend in news. It answers the question of why public media journalism matters to society, gives our news, uh, news a clear purpose, they say at EBU. News organizations around the world have adapted this, from uh, Emily sitting there from the BBC, trying to work with that. Um, the public service companies in all over Scandinavia and news organizations around the world, also in Australia and in Georgia. So just to say, this is what we talk about. And we have been talking about that. And it's not because we think we have all the answers. We just like to have, ask questions. And one of the most experienced persons in uh, public journalism in Europe is actually with us today. It's uh, Eva Landa. Uh, working for SVT, before that also for Swedish radio, and she has been, she's the queen of public debates in public television. She's been running political hearings, political debates up to elections for a generation or so, um, even though she's very young. Um, and he, she's here to talk about um, what she did before and what she's trying to change and what you have done about it. Mm. So, welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Ulrich. Um, yes, so I am a, have been a publisher for a very long time, and I have had uh, res uh, the responsibility for you can what take we it do. Off. You can take that off. You think? Yes. <laughs> Otherwise, yeah? we can't hear oh, you. Oh, he says yes. He said no. Uh, just the water. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'll get all wet. Um, yes. So um, uh, I've been responsible for what we do in the newsroom every day. Uh, I mean the. Bread and butter work, uh, but, uh, bread and butter work, um, which means uh, interviews, smaller, small or large debates between politicians and people in power. And I have to admit that I love really hot fights, quarrels, and when uh, the politician attack each other for what they have not delivered politically. You know, uh, to me, it's like a good play, and I've been stuck to that for a very long time. Um, and I knew also that what was said in our debates at the Swedish television between well-known people in power in Sweden could be quoted afterwards by journalists in uh, other media and on our own platform, which was good publicity. We got attention on our company and on my programs. I was happy. And for a long time, I also thought that through the debates, we could clarify to the audience the differences between opinions and the differences between political parties. My problem was that the debates often received a lot of criticism afterwards from the audience. 
a good part of the viewers thought that there were too much fighting in the debates and that the politicians uh, did not really answer either to our or each other's questions. That was a problem. And very strongly, the audience also asked for more facts and less opinions and feelings. So I got a crazy idea and I brought in a therapist into the newsroom to see if he could help us to make the debates more interesting to the audience. He began by asking us why we place the debater on each side of a table. That's what you talked about, Ulrich. Uh, to make them, it was like we wanted to make them ready for an attack. So he asked us to try to uh, place politicians in conflict next to each other instead and see what happens. So we did and suddenly we had a, dis uh, a discussion with, with much more respect. And you know, it's quite difficult to quarrel with someone or not to listen to someone who is very, very close. You can try, it's, it's difficult. Uh, so something happened and uh, we also found out that we got more interesting answers from uh, the people we had and if we were less aggressive and more exploratory uh, in our attitudes towards those we interviewed or had in our debates. So then there was this question about more facts and less opinions in the debates. So we asked ourselves if we could bring in scientists, researchers in the program, and force the politician to relate to what the scientists said. Could that be a good and a new way to scrutinize the answers from politicians? Today, we have a complementary format to our traditional large debates um, where our eight major parties are represented. We call the format the challenge and the task is to explore political solutions looking forward instead of quarrels. Uh, we also give the politicians time to go deeper into the issue um, we are addressing. So each program focus on one current problem in Sweden, described uh, in a question in the beginning of the program. It could be uh, how to reduce gang violence, which is a huge problem in Sweden at the moment, or how to improve re uh, the results in schools. They are really bad in Sweden. So I'm going to show you a trailer we did about the new format, but Let's start with the sound of a traditional political Swedish debate. debate. This one was uh, between our eight party leaders recently. <laughs> Blåbrun är ju ett etablerat begrepp för just konservativa partier Vem är som jobbar brun, med högerpopulistiska partier. Vem är brun? Jag skulle säga att ditt parti är ett högerpopulistiskt parti. Du kallar du mig för nazist? Blå, högerpopulist, du kallar mig för nazist. Jimmy Åkesson, vi, vi tar, jag förstår, du är uppe. Nej, jag blir riktigt uppe. Vi tar det en i taget. Man kan inte komma tar, undan med det här längre nu. Det är riktigt med det här. SVT needed a format where the leaders of Sweden's eight political parties could give viewers their solutions to societal problems instead of quarrels. This was the result. In the beginning of the program, a question is posed. Researchers, each specialized on a specific subject related to the question, are interviewed when the question is presented. They present scientific proof and results unrelated to politics. The politicians now have to relate to the facts presented by the researchers. But of course not everyone does. Det sa ju forskaren att att det inte riktigt var så. Jo, men det är så. Jag är helt övertygad om det. Jag har två barn själv. The politicians are forbidden to debate or criticize any of the other parties. They are only allowed to answer questions from the presenters about their own party's actions to solve the discussed problem. 
The program lasts about two hours, and at the end, the politicians usually find something to agree on in order to solve some part of the problem. Det som gör mig lite glad det är att alla vill reformera, alla vill ha både ett skolsystem som håller ihop. Det hör jag tydligt och att vi ska ha frågor också som är klassrumsnära. The viewing figures after these hearings are not as high as after traditional party leader debates, but the reactions are far more positive. Perhaps all the appreciation that the format receives shows that in the time we live in, discussions about facts and solutions to problems are more suitable than confrontation. You may applaud. Thank you, Eva. Um, exciting. And uh, you actually continue doing it uh, as a format, and uh, you do it more and more. You just had uh, one also about educational system and private schools I was watching, and it was really, really interesting. Yeah, and we tried to have one on, on security politic, which was, um, yeah, you know, a, a very discussed question in Sweden now. As we are not in the NATO. Can, can I just ask you one question? Because you're not allowed to ask any questions due to Corona, because, and you have face masks on. <laughs> but but what, what was the reactions uh, internally at the, and in the newsroom when you started doing that? Did they think that was the way to do it? Or was there, were they all applauding and th thought you were a hero? Um, no, not in the beginning. We have been uh, working a lot with our interviews and, and uh, debates. Uh, no, not in the beginning, but I think there are some, uh, there are quite many now that are persuaded that it is a good way to, to work. So, uh, yes, uh, I would say that the politicians were more confused than the journalists. Yeah. Because they are so used, you know, to fight each other. And when they came and we, we invited them to this uh, discussion, they said, it's, it's impossible. I can't stand here and not criticize my, the, the opponent of, of my po uh, politic. It's impossible. Because and they we trained said, in no, Jinsen. you are yeah. not allowed. And when they tried to do, uh, to do that in the debate, uh, the, the anchors went in and said, stop, no. We want to hear your solution. And they were a little bit confused. There was one party afterwards who said, uh, this was really something good because we are so stuck in journalists and polit uh, politicians together in the way how we uh, discuss politics today. So. Thank you very much. We'll hear um, from uh, Gro Engen. Um, Gro is heading a project which is extremely interesting at the Norwegian a public service called NRK, um, and you're an experienced journalist and debate host and uh, whatever, and you, uh, with your good colleagues, you have been working on a new debate format, which we would like to talk about. Okay. Hit it. Should I do yeah, that? So. Yeah. Yes, we call that, do you agree? No accusation and no suspicion. Well, as you see, this is our little informal studio. This is actually in our garage in NRK. Our CEO parks his car there. He had to move away. Um, what it all started with was that two of my colleagues were working in the traditional debate shows and for several years. And they, what they saw was that the debate wasn't really changing. What they came with and what they left with was the same thing. And that was going on and on. The politicians were very well prepared with the communication advisor. They had the little one-liners and pre-rehearsed phrases that they went around with. But when the cameras and the lights were off, a different discussion happened. Their shoulders were let down. They spoke in a more everyday language. They even listened to each other and started to ask each other questions. And they decided that, OK, that's the debate that we want to make, when they act more like real persons. So, um, so that's how it all started. And what we actually spent the most time on, some of what Eva said, the most time we were spending on training them to do that, to be real people, when we were going to record this. And um, why it's hard intellectually, they understood it. But it's like, OK, so am I going to sit and listen to him without attacking, people might misunderstand and think I'm not from the party that I really am. 
And so we spent a lot of time on that, like it's a good atmosphere, sit down, you don't have to prepare yourself, you know this by heart, maybe you've been doing this work since you were a young politician at 15 years old. You know this, it's only to be listening, asking questions, not interrupting, and see how it goes, and see how it is to be listened to. And it's the fact that in Norway, a lot of the young audience are leaving the traditional TV debates because uh, they don't like the interruption and the arguing. They, want, they don't get any more wiser after seeing the show. It's just a match and someone is going in to win it and I didn't learn anything from it. So um, we're making this uh, in addition to the traditional debate show. We have some rules in the debate some dogmas. We actually took out the host, so we don't have a host, which leaves a lot of responsibility on the participants. What we do, it's not actually true, because we do have a host, but she's sort of taken out. And if they don't follow the rules, she's coming in and say, hey, hey, you're doing the political bullet points, you're doing the traditional accusations, don't do that, we're gonna edit it out. You remember, you're just gonna listen, and you ask questions, and so on. And we have statements that start each discussion. So here it's unfair that some of us are born rich. And then they start to discuss that. They're not prepared about the statements, but of course they know what they're going to speak about. Like this time it was economy and taxes. Um, so I'm going to show you a clip here because, and we also didn't, it's, it's not just local politicians. We have top politicians in the show as well. And these are, he's from the Conservative Party. He's in the leadership, that's the biggest party in Norway at the time. She's from the far left wing party. Um, and uh, she of course thinks this is unfair. He disagrees. And let's see how they discuss this without our training, how they, he explains why. 90% of what the so-called rich in Norway is, is not money on account. Det er bedriften deres, det er arbeidsplasser og verdiskaping. Og det trenger vi i Norge hvis du skal ha en velferdsstat. Det er på en måte andre sin arbeidsplass. Det er vel kanskje der vi er litt sånn uenige, for du tenker at det er på en måte den arvingen, arbeidsplassene som faren har lagd på en måte. Mens jeg tenker at denne arvingen arver jo da arbeidsplassene til foreldrene til masse andre og sine like gamle folk. Og at det er helt ulogisk at for eksempel min familie som har fisket i 14 generasjoner, av det så står det igjen et hus og et naust som vi er veldig glad i, men som har ingen verdi. Mens barna til rederne som har eid rederiene som min familie har fisket i 14 generasjoner, de har veldig, veldig store verdier og muligheten til å velge seg et helt annet liv enn det jeg har. Fordi hvis du mener at det er så urettferdig da, at noen arver også kanskje store formuer, så må du jo ha noen politiske verktøy som hindrer at det kan skje. Og da lurer jeg på hva er det du skal gjøre med det? En ting som vi foreslår er jo å innføre en skatt på arv. So it's uh, one simple question from him without accusation. And she actually, actually answers with using examples of her own life, which isn't that normal in Norway. And um, she actually did a very good thing. I think, I think she was the one that prepared herself the best of all our participants because she didn't tell her party that she was coming to this new debate show. Um, she didn't do any preparation at all. She only thought about what to wear. And she was the best prepared of all of them to do this kind of discussion. And so we came bits, step, uh, steps further. We, we have to work uh, further on this and go on experimenting. But also what we did to explain them of what we wanted, we used some comparisons. We used, for instance, marriage therapy. Think about it. You sit down opposite each other, you look each other in the eye, and you are listened to. That feels so good. And when you then want to listen to the other part and maybe ask questions and you have this dialogue that it's working so much better, but better than attacking. And also we did the comparison of a, di of a dinner party. That you are invited to friends, uh, you know some other friends are coming that you really like, but you know you, are, you totally disagree with them. But you don't come there and sit down and are a very impolite guest attacking them. You ask them questions and you get more information, you leave that party wiser than when you came. So, and when we use those comparisons, I think they more or less understood it. Intellectually they understood it, but we still had to work very much on it. And it is a recognition for us as journalists and debate journalists that our work has been very much to drive these politicians further apart. 
than they really are. So we're turning that around. I will show you a last video because we also made a video of some of our par participants after the debate, telling how they felt this kind of, how this kind of discussion is. And here they have been debating uh, racism, immigration. Uh, we had four participants. We had different episodes. In some of them, there were only two people. That was always two politicians. And in others, we had four, two politicians, and two other people engaged in the theme. So we're going to see some of uh, the reactions after the debate about immigration. <laughs> Det er kult at man kan lytte til hverandre uten å liksom måtte argumentere imot, men forstå. Det, vi gjør ikke det så ofte i Norge. Vi bare vil gå og attacke, men her sitter vi og prøver å forstå hverandre. Veldig lite polarisering, og det tror jeg er konstruktivt. Jeg tror håp er så viktig å ikke miste. Faktisk er det viktig. Mm. Og jeg er veldig stolt over... Uh, Debatten da, jeg synes det var skikkelig hyggelig å sitte her i dag og kunne liksom diskutere på en ordentlig måte og ikke liksom skulle prøve å overbevise ti stykker hjemme i stua som ikke er her liksom. Så jeg, jeg har lyst til å ha mer av det her, tror jeg. Ja. Just, just a question, because when, when you started uh, thinking about this, it was because you did a survey and you, you realized Norwegians said, we don't want this, we don't want all this politician quarrel, and I remember you sent a delegation to us and said, what can we do about that, because this is all we do, so what can we do differently? I remember some of you talked about when was the bait, when was the political conversation the best? And you talked about that people, before they went into the studio, they were sitting in the makeup room, and during that time, sometimes they were sitting with closed eyes and talked to the person next to them, and they were just having this very, very interesting conversation about real issues, and, but they were behaving well. Is that, that, that's true, right? And you, you took out the, the anger, and that was, so how, can we, how can we replicate that situation where they're sitting, that feeling comfortable, and, and have a, a real conversation? And the news anchor, she's actually, she's, she's the most famous person in Norway, she's sitting right there. And, and, and she actually, she actually uh, took part of that saying, I have to go out in order to improve, right? Isn't that amazing? I have to go out. Um, you are now doing the second, uh, the second season mm -hmm. of that. And, and uh, what are your challenges and what are you trying to improve? Well, um... We are experimenting further. We are doing things quite differently. Just to say something about this, because this was uh, broadcasted during a local election. So we were in competition with all the other election programs, which made it difficult. And also a program has to grow on people. So when something is new, it maybe it needs the third or second season to, to be familiar and people sort of use it more. But for the next, but, but it's also a recognition that it's a nice discussion. It's a nice way to, way of speak, but it also is a bit boring. So um, what we're doing now is, uh, because this time we were very concerned about that they were um, supposed to like each other and it's not a very nice atmosphere. It's not going to be a quarrel, behave nicely. But this time we are doing it a bit differently. Uh, we put back in the host. We chose subjects that are the most polarized subjects in Norway. For, for the time being, it is uh, gender. Uh, we're talking about a third gender in Norway. It's uh, narcotics. Maybe mental health will be uh, a theme. And we're putting in people that are totally opposite, that really dislike each other and are a bit scared to meet. And we're going to focus and try to make the moderator, uh, uh, do you call it negotiate? Yeah, yeah. yeah. negotiate between them. Hmm. So it's interesting. We, we just run a project where we, were, where we were trying to learn from other professions that were very good to go into a room of conflict and see how did they do. You were talking about the marriage counselor. We also had a visit from a hostage negotiator.
I mean, that's a conflict. How do you get them talking? Or, or a conflict negotiator between unions and SAS and the pilots. How do you do that? How do you get them to talk? And what are the, what are the questions? What, how does the room look? What do they eat? All that we could learn from. And it's really, really interesting. So we look forward to seeing the next uh, season how you do that. But the thing about, okay, this idea that if you just talk and there's no fighting, it's boring. Um, and as you said, I mean, we, we also like as a human being, as journalists, we, we also, I mean, sometimes fighting is interesting and important. But, and if you're just sitting there, it, it could be boring. If there's somebody who's very, very good at looking at that, it's this woman. Um, how do you take a debate and make it entertaining and still full of substance? Um, and Dorte Löwendale Bowman, she's a journalist educated at the TV2, she's now a consultant, and she was hired in to help with a regional TV station called TV2 Funen um, to change the debates. Um, and just to say, we've been working with this regional TV station for uh, quite some time. Um, they have agreed with their board that their strategy is constructive journalism. They want to be the most constructive journalism uh, newsroom in the, ha in the world. Um, which is quite ambitious, um, but they're working with it for, for quite a long time. They've changed their slogan as one and the mission statement. The mission statement in the old days was something not very ambitious, like we help people and the island of food killing time, um, something like that. And now it, now it is, together we want to improve life on Fyn. So everything they do, it's in order to improve life. They cover a problem in order to have it fixed. So that's the whole mindset of what they're doing. And they came to us and said, we want to do debates and up to the local election, but we, want, we need to do them different. We don't know how to. And the result was what you were talking about. And I look forward to that because that's not boring. And I have this one? Yeah. One, yeah. Everything. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I'm here to talk to, um, today about the TV program called Salt or Squeezed. And, um, it's actually a TV program about uh, how constructive journalism helps solving problems in politics. Um, first, I will tell you a little bit about Denmark. In Denmark, we have uh, 98 municipalities, um, and every fourth year we have an election where we choose our mayor and our council. Um, 10 of those municipalities is on the island of Fyn. You can see it in the square, and these 10 municipalities is covered by TV2 Fyn. And yes, uh, we had this election last uh, November and uh, last summer. The editor at TV2 Fyn called me and with this question. How can we encourage politicians to cooperate and to solve problems rather than letting them, letting them argue and fight? Can we make a TV program about that? Um, because normally when we have these debates, it's about fights and uh, the viewers are left back confused. And I think the answer to that, yes, of course we can do that. Of course we can make a TV program about that. Um, so uh, together with a bunch of people, um, I was developing um, an election game. Um, because we want, I wanted to do a TV program which is not boring because um, politics, especially politics in the, the small municipalities, is maybe quite boring. Um, so we wanted to, to do something seaworthy, um, and we wanted dramaturgy, uh, and not just talking heads. Um, so we invented this game, uh, which was a, a quite an experiment. Um, there was four politicians from different parties, um, we took a current problem in their municipality. Then we had a box uh, measuring four times eight meters, which was made by, uh, by a carpenter. Uh, we gave the politicians 20 minutes to, to solve this current problem. And every five minutes, the walls in the box would be moving. And then we had the locked door, so the politician couldn't get out of the room. And uh, outside the room, we had the host, and then we had an expert in negotiation, and they could talk into the room. So if the politicians started to fight, started to argue, then they could talk, no, 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 that is not, 
you shouldn't do that. You should find solutions. And they could also help them if, uh, if they was just uh, walking about around the problem. And the rules, because it was a game, the rules uh, were very, cl very clear. If all four of, of the politicians, if they could agree on a solution, they would win the game. And if they couldn't, then they would lose and then they would have a penalty from the mayor in the council, uh, in, the, in, the, in the municipality. And what was, what, what was that, for instance? For instance, it could be um, if they sh should discuss a problem about the elderly care, it could be, okay, then you have to take one day to go to the nursing home and, and help the elderly people. Clean, clean yeah. yeah, stuff like that, yeah. Or clean the beaches. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. But let me dive into the, um, one of uh, the program we made. It was uh, the municipality of Katamina. It's a small municipality with only, I think it's 40,000 people. Um, they had a problem about the elderly care. Uh, they thought the quality of the elderly care was not good enough. Um, the social uh, and health assistance, they had too little time to give care to the elderly. And there was a massive lack of social and health assistance. And actually, we, there are so, some calculations in Denmark uh, in total. In 2030, in Denmark, we will need 42,000 extra social health, social and health um, assistance. And in, in Katamini, it's around 250. And, and that is a big amount because it's a small municipality. Um, let me just show you a, um, a, so, a small summary of uh, the program. It's a three minute summary. Um, the program in total is about 10 or 11 minutes, but um, I will show you the yeah, next three minutes. Så har vi Kalvinde Kommune. Det er jo en uh, lidt uh, tricky problemstilling okay. mm. <laughs> med mangel på plejepersonale blandt andet. Ja. Så. Hold op. Jamen, så er vi, uh, så er vi. Så er vi lukket, ikke? <laughs> God stemning. Ja. Vi skal gøre os uh, selv uh, attraktive. Jo, det men der er, uh, der er det jo også, at vi er blevet nødt til at, at tale det der job op. Ja. Det er nu de i gang med at snakke uh, løsninger efter hvad? To minutter? Men man skal ikke bare sige, jamen... Uh, jeg, jeg, jeg skal være socioassistent. Jamen, så er jeg socioassistent. Nej, du kan jo faktisk blive rigtig meget andet, ja. hvis man og først har den uddannelse. Den åbner jo for mange døre. Ja, lige og, lige og det skal man udtale op. 3, lige præcis. 2, 1. Der er 15 minutter tilbage. Ja. Nu, nu synes vi rummet, det øh, skrumper. Det er nok lige, vi vil have til at skrive på tavlen. Ja, ja. det er det. Setup'et her, det er jo anderledes end, end den måde, man normalt forhandler på. Altså det her, det er jo forhandling på speed date niveau, ikke? Altså nu har jeg en usædvanlig grim håndskrift, men det gør så også, at vi ikke kan hænge sammen på noget. På men lige nu er det jo så øh, mest en del en samtale, men de skal også på et tidspunkt til lige at konkretisere. Hvis jeg nu skriver mindre teams... Ja. Nu må jeg tillade mig også at skrive øh, mindre, mere selvstyrende Ja, Men det bliver de også, jo. Michael, han er god til, at han, ra han rækker ud. Ja. Mm -hmm. Og samtidig med, at han siger, at han er enig. Så borgeren skal have færre øh, Jamen, det er det forskellige... Jamen, så vi skal, vi skal, ja, skal jo ja, ja. øh, Så der kommer heller ikke det, vi kan indover. Ja. Øh, for det, det var jo også mig før. Jeg tror ikke, at der sker et eller andet her. Der er 10 ja, det der. minutter ja. tilbage. <laughs> Så venter jeg med at skrive. Ja, ja, det. det var sådan lidt uh, surrealistisk, ja, ja. og jeg tror, vi, vi vidste jo godt, det ville ske. Men da det så alligevel sker, så bliver man sådan lidt uh, uha. Ja, nu skal vi hu huske på, at, uh, at uh, de sidste 20 år har man kørt efter lister og afkrydsningsskemaer. Ja, ja. Jeg tænker, hvis vi forholder os til Kan I prøve at skrive ned, altså det der med, hvordan ja. I vil for eksempel tale jobbet op? Hvordan vil I sikre høj faglighed? Fem, Faktisk så er fire, der jo i dag... Tre. Øh, to, mulighed for at tage en gymnasial øh, uddannelse, samtidig med at du så bliver uddannet som social- og sundhedsassistent. Ja. Ja. Så det at tale jobbet op, det kunne også være at, hvad hedder det... Øh, Nej, vi kommer ikke andet øh, endnu. <laughs> Giv noget mere til, uh, til yes. uh, hvad hedder det, klæde vores studievejleder bedre på et resultat. Vi skal have studiejob på plejecentret. Ja. ja, og tale job op. Så skriver jeg skolebesøg. Der er godt to minutter tilbage, I skal til at skynde jer. Så nu skal du til at skynde dig ja. at skrive. Ja, men jeg ved ikke, hvad jeg skal skrive. Skal skrive at vi skal Man kan jo sige, at de har bogstaveligt talt sat deres fingeraftryk på aftalen. Spørgsmålet er, kan vi få deres underskrift? Ja, ja. Du får det hele. Vi får gerne det hele. Ja. Okay. Her, der var i hvert fald min. Ja. Ja. <laughs> nu har vi også sekunder. 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Så vi kan ikke lige tvælge. 
det der med på tid. Vi skal bare finde en løsning. Altså, øh, øh, så tror jeg at nogle gange, jamen, så kører den altså lidt hurtigere, men gear tager lidt mere. Det gjorde jo et eller andet ved vores måde at blive konkrete på. Og det, det var da en, en, en sjov øjenåbner. Um, they came up with three main solutions. You couldn't see that in the small summary. Um, the first one was that they agreed that they would organize the social and health assistance in smaller teams. So they would give back responsibility to the social and health assistance so they can make their own decisions together with the elderly people. Before, it was a person in, in the center of the municipality who took those decisions, but they were giving back the responsibility to the social and health assistance. Um, secondly, they uh, ch um, they made up that they should visit the seventh grade in primary school and tell the students about this education because it's very important in the very young age to tell uh, the students, hey, you can do this job and it's not just about changing diapers, it's about giving care to the elderly people. And um, thirdly, um, they decided that they would hire young people to work at the nursing homes just to have fun with the elderly people and uh, just to give some quality time to elderly people. And the best part of that is that then the young persons could see how it is to work on the nursery homes. Um, and then you might ask, oh God, this is just a game. What about the reality? It is a game. Uh, could it work in reality? Um, and actually the answer is yes, because as we speak right now, we're about to edit, edit uh, a follow-up program about this municipality, Katamine. And uh, all those three main solutions, uh, they have been taken out into reality. At the first picture, you can see Tina sees a social and health assistant. Before she was uh, not proud of her job, she made, she made uh, mistakes. Um, and then now she's thinking she can make a difference. And the elderly people feels that difference as well, because now she, She knows the person she's going out to and that she didn't knew the person before because she was just driving around because there was this central person in the mun municipality uh, deciding who should go where. Um, and that at the sec second picture, it's Christina. Uh, she's an employee from the municipality and she's talking to a seventh grade about uh, the, the education. And I guess if you see uh, students at... 13 years old, uh, just like, oh, boring. But after, actually, afterwards, they were just, wow, it was quite exciting. And can we go uh, visit this education? So that was the solution that helped as well. And um, the third solution, the third picture, it's Sophia, and actually it's a kind of a magic moment. Sophia is 14 years old, and she's just started working at a nursery home. Um, and on the picture, you can see her comforting an, an old man, Maurits, um, who's crying, actually, because he's talking about his dead son. And you can say, wow, 14 years old. Mm. Should she do that? Of course she should, because she has the time to listen to him. And he feels that there was, there was this person having time. So it was quality time for him. And she thinks it's the most natural thing to do. Um, learning points, I'll just uh, go through this. Um, we know now that uh, every program was like 10 or 11 minutes. Um, and we know if we should do it again, and I guess they would do it again. Um, we know that the problems has to be very specific. We tried to have some, we had some municipalities discussing green energy and integration. It, it, was, it was not specific enough, enough, so that didn't work that well. And um, we also know in the editing, we should be using more time explaining the problem because then the viewers would know the solutions even better. Um, and constructive journalism is also about explaining the problems um, because the problem is a fundament to getting into the solutions. And then you might ask me, what about the politicians? What did they say? Um, and I talked to all 40 politicians before they entered the room and after they entered the room. And I would say that 38, 39 of them was not just happy, 
they were actually totally excited with stars in their eyes. And we, they were, wow, we shouldn't argue because they were trained to be arguing, but they shouldn't. They were punished if they were arguing. Um, so they loved the format. They really loved the format. And, um, and as this quote, it was also an, an eye opener for them because uh, like uh, Michael from Katamina saying, this experiment was an eye opener. Of course, we cannot solve every problem in a municipality in just 20 minutes, but it shows that we in the future should be faster making decisions and solutions instead of just talking about the problems. Yeah. You may applaud. <laughs> but, but what is really, really interesting about this experiment, and it is an experiment, is what we actually do here, we change the incentive structures of a debate. And changing incentive structures is really, really important. I mean, what does it, and, and these politicians, why did they go into politics? They went into politics because they wanted to solve things, fix problems for people. And suddenly they were being appraised for doing exactly that, which they were not outside. Because in order to be a good politician, you had to get into the news. How do you get into the news? If you attack someone, right? And they've been trained by former journalists called spin doctors to do exactly that. And it's just making it worse. So changing the incentive structures and, and talking about that, and, and, and you're doing the same thing in your program. You, you change what, what people are being appraised for doing. And I think that's what's really fascinating. So there's a guy down there, he's Italian, so he's very strict. He's, a, he's constantly showing me an amount of fingers, showing how long time we have left. We don't have many fingers left. Um, but I, I, there's, there's just one, the, the Nobel Peace Prize was giving out to journalists, two journalists. One of them has been silenced, he's Russian. Uh, the other one is Maria Risa from uh, the Philippines. When she accepted her uh, award uh, in, in Oslo at the Nobel Peace Prize um, uh, Committee uh, event, uh, she did a speech, and you should watch it online, because it's a reminder of what we should do. She said, without facts, you can't have truth. Without truth, you can't have trust. Without trust, we don't have, we don't have no shared reality, no democracy, and it becomes impossible to deal with the existential problems of our time. Climate, coronavirus, and now the battle for truth. And I think that's a reminder for all of us what's, what journalism can do, and that's what's the reason why two journalists got this award. Um, we run this fellowship program. Some of them are in this room. And uh, last year, we couldn't go to the United States as planned to watch big buildings and big thoughts. So we thought, what to do instead? So we had to stay in Denmark. We want to, went up to see a lighthouse. This lighthouse was about to fall into the beach of Jutland in Denmark due to the erosion of time. The wind of change was taking off the sand. And it was about to fall down, just like Wind of change is changing journalism, and sometimes it falls. News deserts is a big thing. Alan Rutzbridge, a great former editor of The Guardian, once said, journalism is like lighthouses. There are no business models for lighthouses, but ships sink without them. So should it be, OK, if it can't stand, let it fall. Um, the, the guy who was being asked to tear it down before it fell down, um, a brick worker, a local guy, um, thought, well, this is a pity. It's a it's really important that it's there. So he started dreaming. Can we do something about that? What about moving it into safety? And he did so. He moved this 750 tons of lighthouse further into land so it was placed in security. What we're all here for is basically doing the same thing with journalism. Journalism is important for society. It's about falling down because of our incentive structures, because of our culture. But it can be saved. It can be done. It is possible to move big things, even culture around public debates. And that's what this session has been all about. Yes, we can fix it. Thank you for coming. Thank you.